Religious Truth. This is our second podcast. I'm excited to do this podcast today. I have a special guest today. I have Pastor David Brown. I'm going to let him introduce himself. And then I have Neil from last time. Uh, we're going to go over a very interesting topic. We're going to go about the necessity of men, uh, what are lies about men, and what are truths about men. And Pastor David's going to break it down from us for a biblical account. And what we just asked for you guys to do is just like, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you guys could give, if you have any comments, leave them in the comment section, or if you have anything on Instagram, because this will also be on Instagram as well, so that you can send us a message or a DM. I'll provide Pastor David's social media, so you guys could follow his page. He also has a YouTube channel, where you can look at all his sermons that he, uh, that he has on his YouTube channel, and we'll go from there. So uh, let me introduce Pastor David. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. Uh, how are you feeling today? I'm great. It's Sunday. We had three services in a row this morning. Right. So long I had, day. Had a, little, had a little break this afternoon, so I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a long day. I was, uh, I, I was playing worship today. So I, was, I wasn't there as early as the main. I was there playing for youth. But I got there at 8 and then got out by like 1245. I know you had, a, you had the other service still. Yeah. That one was like around 2, right? Uh, yeah, it gets out about 2. It's 2.30 for the leave. Hey, but it's a good way to spend the day. Right, exactly. And then, uh, Neil, how are you doing? Oh, I was supposed to do it on a busy day, thank God. Very good. I'll just put it that way. Uh, a really busy day, which in terms of almost always, never have a busy day, but not doing anything at all. It makes you feel productive. Right. All right, so we're going to get right into this. Uh, we're going to talk about, so Pastor David is the, he's, He's a pastor of a church, but he's the leader of the men's ministry, and he's also the leader of the missionary ministry. Uh, ministry. And we just had, a, about a month ago, we had the men's conference. So I just want to get some insights from you, Pastor David. Um, the first question I have for you is, uh, what immediate impacts did, you, did it have, the conference have, or in terms of uh, the men and how its effects in the church? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, we're getting so many positive comments from men. Uh, as you know, it was the first ever men's conference that the church had done. Right. And uh, there's been some men's ministry in the past, but one of the things I've heard from men consistently since I've been on staff last couple of years is, you know, we, we, we don't, we're not doing anything for men. We don't have enough for the men, you know. Well, but for the past two years, we've been developing these things. We have Bible studies. We have special events, quarterly men's meetings. But this was the first time we've done a conference. And uh, men loved the conference. They said, oh, when's the next one? We're getting a lot of positive comments uh, uh, from, from the men that participated, that attended. Uh, but wives. Uh, one wife reported back, my, my husband's a brand new man. I can't believe That's how awesome. he's changed. Uh, I, I know of one marriage that was turned totally around. Uh, it was on the rocks. But it, it was like the, the man and his wife just... By the one day after the conference is over, we're delivered from whatever issues that they had, and they're holding hands again. Um, had another wife said her husband came home and could not stop talking about the conference. So those are all positive awesome. things. Men don't do those things normally. Okay? Right, they're they're right. kind of quiet. They're kind of closed, closed up. They, they, you know, they don't talk much. Right, not a few words. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so. so uh, we're getting a lot of good reports from men. That's the litmus test. I mean, there's somebody being helped, right? Right. Yeah. Definitely. And I could even say from, because I went there with, the, with uh, some of my friends. Yeah. And I went there with some of the, the guys from youth. And um, they they really needed it because it's like an example that they're seeing. Because there's some of my friends don't have that example of a, a man who's, a, uh, a, man who's a, right. a Christian and goes to church or holds moral values. Uh, and they have nothing to model after. To see a large... You know, group come together under the name of God um, to build themselves up and follow what what is what am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? Uh, really affected them and actually built some maturity in themselves too, mm -hmm. which is which was awesome with the men's conference and it was great um, having all the speakers speak. I was only able to be there for um, the Friday night mm -hmm. when Pastor David, I mean you and Pastor Charles spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, also the comedian, he was really funny too. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Steel. Uh, wow, I can't come up with his first name. Damn, but he, he was awesome. He was really, really funny. He <laughs> yeah. was really good. Um, but uh, I loved it. Uh, it was, what was the, the three? Bigger. Bigger, better, bolder was right. our game. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That, that's an awesome way. It's, and, it's, and it's true. 
um, we kind of tend to see ourselves in that way, especially as men. Is I mean, I feel like it's, it's innate in our biology too to be bigger, be bolder, and you know, be better. But um, but be guided in the right way. What right, are we right. doing it for? So that's awesome. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? No, um, I actually just don't want to go into that because my girlfriend and I we had a kind of a photo shoot for a commercial at M Seven Eleven. She asked me to go with her. I didn't make the cut uh, at the beginning, so I was pretty excited just to go because I was looking at all the cameras since we've been involved since we started this, and I've been like just seeing cameras for my business and uh, seeing the professional cameras that they have, the lights, and you know, you say, I'm doing this more than me. Honestly, yeah, I thought I was going to make it because we're supposed to be there at five, and they told her she was going to be there for but a few people didn't show up to shoot, then they were like, you know what, dude? We didn't make the cut. Because I, since I shoot my head, I just like it. They were like, yeah, we need someone in there. So. But we didn't have anyone, and we have a hat, so do you mind doing the shoot? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And they're like, yeah, you're the only man with guys that we see here. And I'm like, and I was thinking about it, and I'm like, what did they actually do in my mind? And they said, oh, my God, I know that I look big, but I wouldn't determine myself manly just because of my PC uh, more than anything. I would like to say that when I met the new director, so I'm like, hey, sir, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. If there's anything I can actually help you, just come in. Uh, so that's, that's the main focus I see as for men to go by. Yeah. Yeah, right. Definitely. Good. And um, forgot, I forgot to mention, but Neil has a clothing line and he deals with a lot of photography and uh, video camera work. <laughs> Uh, well, there's going to be a NOAA next conference, and I'm pretty sure, like, with Pastor Charles, so it has to be bigger than, than this one, so. Yeah, we already know we have to move it to our, uh, one of our larger venues, yeah. Right. But it was awesome to have it at the Dabble Church. Yeah, yeah right. it, was, it was a novelty, you know, it was a brand new facility, and uh, uh, that's the largest meeting we've had since we reignited the men's ministry two years ago, uh, and we, we oversold it. Uh, we knew we would have no shows. We oversold it by about 50 people, uh, but we, we all we managed to get everybody in. As well. Right, that's awesome. All right, so we're going to go into our next segment. So speaking about the men's conference and what yeah. has to do with it, uh, we're going to go into today in the world right now. We're seeing a, a huge attack on masculinity on men, and there's a lot of lies out there. Um, it seems that men are being attacked in every form of front whether that will be in terms of their position, in terms of their responsibilities, in terms of uh, what they're supposed to be, what they're not supposed to be, and they're being told lies that they're not good enough for it. So the, the thing that I want to get on right now is, we're going to ask you several questions. I'm going to ask the first one, then Neil will correspond with the next one. So the first question is, um, once you fail, you can never come back. There's a lot of men that hear, oh, you, you've messed up, you can never come back. Whether the mistakes could be minor to major, it could be a, a, a person who's struggled with uh, alcohol, or a person who lost his job, or a person who just can't make it to the next level. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, because of the God we serve, he's the God of the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth chance, okay? I'm sorry, if you're still breathing air, and if God's still alive, then there's still potential for you. Right. Um, you know, Jesus originally called 12 men, men that had been skipped over by the Jewish rabbis. Right. Men that were not special in the eyes of the Jewish leadership, or they would have already been invited to follow a rabbi and to learn from him. That, that's the way their system worked, to be leaders in their, in their culture. Jesus picked 12 men that were just following their dads, fishing, one of them the tax collector. So he's, he's, he's a castaway from the Jewish culture. He picks people that had not excelled, were not highly educated, uh, were even hated by their own people, and, and made them into leaders. Right. And even in the midst of that, think, think about uh, Peter himself, who failed, who denied Jesus three times. That was a failure. And yet Jesus said, hey, Come on, I, I'm, I'm praying for you that your faith fail not. And when you're turned around, strengthen your brethren. And he gave him another go. So it's just a total lie that men can't 
come back from failure or that anybody can't come back from failure. God is a God that perfects his strength in our weaknesses. So that's just it's just a lie from the enemy that a man can't make it after he's failed. Right, I totally agree. And you know, it's a, an interesting thing that I didn't realize as a kid, but I think of the disciples. They were around, you know, their late 20s, early 30s, around Jesus' age. And I always thought of them like all these older guys. And then I, when I read about John, I looked at some historical documents about him. He was the youngest of the disciples. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting is that he was a student, but he wasn't educated as a high student. He was just a, a guy who barely heard some things. He was learning in Ephesus. And when he had come across his disciples, he was working up as a fisherman. But that's like, let's say you own a fishing company and you see a college student or a, a, a high school 18 year old, 19 year old, and he's like, hey, I need to work a part time job, and you bring him a bond with the fish, with the fisherman. So it's funny that John, even him as a, as a young God, didn't discriminate on who, where, where anyone could start, whether you're young or old, and he will bring that calling to you. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, the one I want to say is uh, uh, Second Corinthians talks about, for he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So right there, when it says that, oh, we're a failure, sin sin is the idea of, you know, mistakes, to miss the mark is what it literally translates to. But with Christ, who took up all of our sin, all of our mistakes, we are able to live in that new covenant of being able to, you know, come back, do what we're supposed to do, and follow God's word, and without any memory of it, because it's wiped away from God's memory. I remember it no more, and we're able to come back to what we're supposed to be doing, and I, and I think that's, that's a, it's a truth that we have to remember that all all the things that we have done wrong, all the sin that we have done, Jesus took it all for us. He was the living sacrifice so that we could be, you know, start a new life, be the new creation, to be sons and daughters of God. Right. And it's very important, very important to just that's like the first thing I think a, a, a man or anyone should feel is that when when they when they're sinning or they sin or they've messed up. The first thing that they remember is like, because shame will come into your life and say you're not good enough, not good enough. That they have to remember that you, you were bought for a price, you were redeemed, and you're called to do more. Yeah, and it, that's the thing I feel like everybody should hear. Well, let me add one thing too. Some people make the mistake of thinking that Jesus' redemption, Jesus, the, the sacrifice that He made, the blood that He poured out, uh, the, the, the way He made for us by His cross, right. that that's simply forgiveness of sins. But it's not. There's so much more. He bought and purchased not just forgiveness for our sins, but a, a heart change, a deliverance from the power of sin. Right. Paul wrote, sin shall not have dominion over you. The born-again believer, the born-again man, is not just forgiven. He has become engraced and empowered to overcome. Right. To overcome failure. To overcome sin. And so... There's a there's a chance for anybody not only to be forgiven a failure, but to then overcome where they failed in times past. Uh, there's this, uh, Paul made this statement in the uh, epistle to the Philippians. He said, "It is talking to the born again man, a man that's given his life and heart to Jesus." He said, "It is God that works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure." That God, His Holy Spirit working in you, can transform your will into His will and give you the ability and the strength to actually do what pleases God. There's no such thing as a hopeless case. We can come back and succeed after failure. Right. Yeah, and then, and then the, the Christ's death was the abundant life, you know? Yeah. What He, what he has promised for us. And I know a lot of people get the idea like, oh, okay, you're going into abundancy, you're going into like, Material things versus not our treasure in heaven, but there's a difference. If you're focused on the things of earth without God, you're just doing it for for your own pleasure, and you're taking God out of those things. Mm-hmm. That is that's the vanity. But what makes it fruitful because it's supposed to be a blessing to others, and everything we do is supposed to be giving to others. The the, the uh, there's this one that uh, Thomas Aquinas would say that the thing of a Christian is born again is that you have been blessed so much in your life. That you want the will, the good. You want you want the the will of the good for the other, so that they can re- benefit from Christ as well. Right. And that that's the, the thing is that it's not just for ourselves; it's for others that we go around with. Um, let me see. The the, ne- the next thing I want to go on that speaking on this is that 
uh, Proverbs 24, 16 says that a man shall fall seven times but rises it up again, but the wicked are overthrown by calamity. The word fall in the Hebrew is nafel or yepal, depends on the, on, the, on the verbiage of what you're meaning. Uh, it, t- it tends to correlate to more to calamities. So I think another thing that men may feel is a mistake is, okay, I made this mistake. What happens if it wasn't my fault and it still didn't happen? Like if I was doing everything right and then something happened, I got in a car accident and someone hit me, someone went like this, and it's a setback, right? And the, the, the thing there is that the, when, when a man who falls and he gets up the seven times, the seven times is referring to the sandit, which is the righteousness of God, a righteous man who built his house on the rock, is that even amidst calamities, he's faithful to God, knowing that in this situation, I'm going to overcome, even if it's my mistake or someone else's mistake, I'm going to keep moving forward. Or if it's the world against me, or if it's sin, I'm going to keep going forward. Uh, and I just wanted to see your thought on the idea of, like, you know, when things happen that are not in our control. Well, here's the thing. Christians are not immune to trouble. Jesus said, in the world you shall have trouble. He said, in the King James, tribulation. It's just trouble. We're going to have trouble. The idea of the abundant life, the God kind of life, the idea of victory in life through, through Jesus is not that we're never going to have a problem, but that we have someone living on the inside of us that will guide us, will give us wisdom, will give us power, will strengthen us, will recover us, will heal us. In other words, will operate within us to get through any trouble or any tribulation that comes our way. We're living in a world that was turned over to Satan as our overlord by our great, great, great grandfather Adam. This world is saturated with demonic powers, with evil. Uh, uh, Death is in the world. Okay, so we're not immune to those things, but we can't overcome anything through the presence of God, the Word of God, the, the gospel of God, the, the, the tools, the weaponry that God's given us. So whether something happened because it was your fault or it's simply an attack of the evil one or because of the people that you're kin to or that you fellowship with or that you do business with that bring an end to your world makes no difference. Jesus still lives on the inside of you to recover, to move forward, to gain the victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our connection with God through faith. Right, the, the pistos, that's the Greek for the faith. It, it's, it's something, and you know, it's, it's really interesting with the idea of faith. It's Because maybe some people think, well, I don't have faith. Well, the thing that's interesting in the Greek word for pistos is the God-given faith given to us. That in the, in the, Paul says that you have been given the measure of faith. People say a measure, but so everyone has different measures. That's not what it means. It's the measure of faith. That we have the whole measure of faith that God has given unto us. And that is something that, you know, keeps us going through the midst of the storms or whatever. Uh, Neil, you, you go ahead and ask the next question. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the church doesn't need men, and so can men actually redeem themselves? <laughs> you mean after they've done really poorly for a yeah, while? Yeah, really poorly in life, because <laughs> um, like Chris mentioned, one of the things that uh, we fall victims to is one mentality and their own guilt. And with that, when men tend to do mistakes or fell in life, we have the tendency, we have the idea that that's what, who we are and our sins. So, and that's something I heard about, he was a pastor, he was talking about it, and he was talking to the guy that he was really addicted to alcohol and marijuana. And he was a hey pastor, I want to go to church, but I heard so many drinking and then you can start drinking weed. And the pastor said, no, you can't. You can do church. You can still do that, but you can do church. He said, but I'm an addict. I'm falling to this thing. Why am I going to do church? And he said, here's the question, son. When you get a job, 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 or do you feel yourself in the job? Right. And he's like, it's the same way. Exactly. Exactly. Well, the old adage is you have to catch a fish before you clean it. Right. Right? Uh, Here's another old saying. The church is not a museum 
for the perfect. It's a hospital for the hurting. Right. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Number, your first question: Do we need men? Yes, we desperately need men in the church. Desperately need men in the church. Uh, we need their manpower. We need their masculinity. We need their ability to to lead, to create, to build, to advance, to be proactive. Desperately, we need men in the church. In fact, for hundreds of years, the church has been too feminine. It's been slanted, veered toward the feminine, because many times the great majority of the people faithful to the church and uh, working in the church and volunteering in the church and, 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 and pushing the program of the church forward has been women a lot of times have been an absence of men. Some men have the idea that to be spiritual or to be a church-going person is reserved for women and children. And that, that's exactly the wrong idea. When Jesus started out, he picked 12 men to start his movement with. Right. Okay? Um, uh, men are so vital. And and here's the thing. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a process for a person's life to come together. It's a process for someone to mature in their faith. It's a it's a process. Uh, yeah, we, we invite people to come, to come just like you are. Jesus accepts people just like they are. He loves us enough to accept us right where we are. But then he loves us too much to leave us that way. You right. know, we need men, but we also need men to pursue Jesus and to become the men that he wants them to be. Let, let me give you a, a quick story that illustrates this. I brought up Peter a while ago. Peter failed. Peter, one of the original 12, he denied Jesus in front of a couple of guys and a little girl. He, he didn't have the bravery to say, yes, I know him. He said, I, I don't know. I don't know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know him. He'd been following him for three and a half years. And he denies Jesus. He's a man who fails, right? Later, after the resurrection, Jesus, uh, Peter and some of his buddies, right. disciples, had gone fishing. John, John, John. Jesus comes, finds them. He's standing on the beach. They recognize it's Jesus. He's made breakfast for them on an open fire. They come back off of the sea. They gather there. They're eating breakfast together. And Jesus asked Peter, looks at him, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And he used the Greek word uh, agape. Right. Do you love me? With uh, And agape is a self-sacrificing love, the God kind of love. It's a, it's a love that puts others before yourself. Do you love me? And Peter answers and said, oh, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, except he used a different word. He used the word phileo. Right. which is brotherly love. Right. Mm -hmm. So think about what happened. He said, hey, Peter, do you love me enough to sacrifice me? Do you love me to the ultimate degree? He says, well, <laughs> I love you like a brother. That was his response. He's being honest. He didn't have a high assessment of his own love level toward Jesus. Right. Jesus said, well, I want you to feed my sheep. Jesus asked me again, he says, hey, do you love me with agape love? Peter answers again the same way. Well, Lord, you know I love you with phileo love. I love you like a brother. He says, I want you to feed my sheep. Okay? Then Jesus takes Peter's word. He says, okay, Peter, do you phileo love me? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, oh, yeah. Jesus, you know I love you like a brother. He says, feed my lambs. Notice Jesus was willing to take Peter at the level that Peter could give him at the moment. He starts out with that high level of expectation. But when Peter says, I'm just not there yet. I, I, I've, I've seen my weakness. I've seen how I cave when the pressure is on. I don't love you to the ultimate yet. But I love you like a brother. It's kind of like, I'm not willing to do everything, but I'm willing to be made willing. Just God, start. let me start where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And Jesus accepts that from Peter. I believe Jesus will take anybody at the level they are. And yes, they should come to church because then we can start to rebuild their lives and make them into the men that God wants them to be. Right, totally. And 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 in the thing too is like, okay, well, someone's living in sin, like addiction, or it could be any other form of sin. It's you don't condemn them. You, it's the love of God that turns men to repentance. And when when they go into church and they read the scripture and they were honest with them, it's like, this is what it says, but I'm going to show you what the right way is supposed to be. That conviction, which is the right conviction, not the conviction that. 
you're not good enough, so you're living in the sin, and you're not doing worthy of God, that's based on works. The conviction is like, you're going out this situation, but I'm handing it over to God, and he's going to change that situation for me, and I'm going to continue my, 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 my walk with God. Yeah. And then an interesting thing, especially that I love John 21, John, at this, he wrote John chapter 21 after Peter's death, and he was older, and John was his language out of all the disciples, other than Paul, his writing style was very philosophical, very theologically based. And um, when they caught the fish, it was 153. We talked about this at the yeah. events ministry. Yeah. That even during his work, when he was working, doing his doing his job, fishing, right? He caught 153. John saw that. Peter just caught the fish, saw Jesus, jumped out of the boat and was swimming. John's pulling the fish and thinking there's 153 fish here. And when they would count it, was that depending on how the Greeks would count, it would be one, five, three, and then word had symbols or meaning. So one means sex, five means like rebel, and the three was re referring to a you or yourself. It's the one is, you know, I, the five is the pentagon, which is five points, and then three has to do with the idea of love. So in the Greek, it's sela rebel petros, because 153 written in the Greek spells out Peter. So when John gets it and sees Peter going up to Jesus, or later on, probably when he's recounting this and writing this down, he's writing that when Jesus got that fish for Peter, it's saying, I adore you, Peter. So Jesus' love was working in Peter's life before he even physically told it to him, before he even had to give his action, it was already in his work. And sometimes as men, we could be working, we could be having a hard day at work, I'm in real estate, so I could be showing homes, I could be exhausted. But even in those situations or in work I'm doing, we don't realize that God's love is working right through those situations. I could be showing a home, I'm exhausted and tired, and in that, God is like, I love you, I adore you, I care about you. And it keeps going through, through all my work. And and it's right, um, when Peter, he responds with the philo, and then Jesus responds with the agape, and uh, Aristotle actually has his book right here, which is about, uh, he has, in book three, he talks about what is love. And he talks about the agape love, the unconditional love. And Aristotle was having a really hard time trying to find an example of someone who truly expresses the agape love, using it of a mother. But he said even a mother doesn't have like, the idea of agape love. Because in order for her to love something, the condition is that the baby has to be in her. Beforehand, she didn't love it. Beforehand, she doesn't know it exists. So then he says, gope eso. Which is, so agape is the full gope is that until someone comes, or literally translated until he comes. So 300 years before before the Peter was out there, Aristotle didn't even know that he literally was talking about Christ through that one thing. So then he came up with the formulation of the top. And it's, it's, it's true, that love, it's, and it's something like it. Um, let me get into the next question. So, oh, we're actually gonna be talking about this. So it's the same question, but it's about why Why is it important for godly men? Like, what's the great thing about godly men going to church and then bringing what they've learned in church and the family home? And I'm going to give you a quote. This is a, it's a, it's a different quote, but it, it kind of correlates with it. Uh, Plato said, when I hear a man discoursing of virtue and any sort of wisdom, who is a true man and worthy of his being, I am delighted beyond measure, and I compare the man with his words and the note of harmony and correspondence of them. And such as one, I deem him to be a true musician, having given the thought of virtues in his home. So he's talking about, uh, I'm gonna hear men talk about the good, talk about the virtue, talk about wisdom. And I'll apply that in a Christian sense of a man who's reading the word of God, prophesying, prophesying the word of God, speaking it in his family home. Why is that so important? Well, because of his unique role as the leader of his wife and the mentor of his children, obviously. If, and, and, and here's, it's important to establish this. So many people think that church attendance is just a spiritual act in and of itself that somehow is going to improve a person. Okay? Like if they walk into the door or into the sanctuary of the church, that somehow by osmosis, they get some kind of right. strength, blessing, uh, ability 
and that somehow they got points in heaven because they showed up. None of that's true. The church is a gathering place for people to be edified or built up. Okay, built up. In our, our theme at the conference last month was bigger, better, bolder. And we, we, we talked about we, we need to get bigger on the inside, spiritual growth, spiritual development. That's going to make us better acting and doing on the outside. Right. Who you are on the inside always comes out. We live out of our souls. We live out of our hearts. Okay? So God wants us to make, make us a man bigger on the inside so he can perform and do his duties better on the outside uh, and uh, bigger, better, and that's going to result in him being bolder because the better that you perform, the more confidence you have in yourself and the bolder you are with your faith. Okay, right. this is the idea of going to church. To be built up, to be taught, be de to, be, to be developed in maturity, okay? Educated, mm -hmm. trained, right. to live life to the fullest, to live life in victory, to live life in Jesus' name, to live life as a, a servant of the kingdom of God. And it's so important for him to lead his wife into that, to lead his children into that. Let's talk statistics for a moment. Right. When a woman is one to God, she'll come to church and her kids will come to church, maybe for a little while. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So statistically, it's proven that if a man becomes a Christian and begins to attend church, the wife, almost without ex exception, the wife and all the children will come with him and will stick to it and follow through and begin to live the Christian life. Right. The man has such, the husband, the father has such an impact, such an effect on his family because they've fallen into the divine order. And when you fall into the divine order, then you have divine blessing on, on what, you, what you're pursuing. Right, and that's so true. I've heard that before, like, in the kids, so seeing their father do that, model that, and then when they grow up, they consistently bring their kids to church. So it's like a, the domino effect. Absolutely. And little girls will follow, keep following their mother, but little boys, finally, they want to be like dad. They want to be a man. And if they don't see church attendance as manly, then they're out. Right, yeah. And, and I know uh, Jared mentioned that in our church, we're, we're split 50-50, which is great, that we're there. We still want to do you know, more, right? But around the world right now, churches in the United States, actually, I'll just say it's mainly in the United States. There have been some issues in Canada as well, but the, the Greek Orthodox Church is pretty dominant, pretty dominant over there and it turns out more uh, masculine, I mean masculine, more men in the services. But here in the U.S., it's like down to 30 to 40 percent of men attend church and the majority is 60 or 70 percent of women attend church. And because of that, you're also seeing like small churches, you know, attendance goes down and as attendance goes down, churches get smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, it just, and you look at the impact within states or within cities, as those churches get smaller, you notice that crime goes up, exactly. you notice that Absolutely. other issues go up, you know, and you notice that social programs that were helping or protecting families, they're gone. Oh, what happened to, you know, the food drive? We were having a food drive that was provided for the city, you know, 20 years. Now it's gone. Now there's a huge need that's missing there because that need is missing. Now more chaos get erupt from that. Um, you, you got the, you got the next question. Yeah. Um, yeah, number three. Yeah, uh, it's the same church, one. Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's the church's job to decide, uh, discipline uh, family. Or a disciple. Disciple family. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to touch a little back on what you guys were saying on uh, the statistics of yeah, 15, 50, and yeah. nowadays 30% uh, of the men are. Yeah, it's like 30% like in the And it's not like that. We're not downgrading one or anything like that, which is, in my opinion, the way I see it. Uh, we pointed out the weaknesses in men, which is they're not being consistent, they're not being dedicated. Right. There's, there's lacking from some faith right. that are truly needed in the family. Uh, we can Google this, don't call me on this 100%, but what about single mothers? How often do you guys see a single mother in our face? Is there Thirty two percent more? Yeah, I'm not saying it's a high number. It's really a really high. Right. Uh, don't get me wrong, cost your mom taking the responsibility of that, but probably not. 
want to put the attention to that. And that affects because we talk about how the kids fall over the parents, you, especially the father. So the responsibility, and we, we don't measure, we don't acknowledge the responsibility that we have as men, or as family members of this individual, how we can impact others. That's something that I'm really concerned, I guess. Um, because in, uh, for every single mother, uh, they have a 60 to 70 percent probability that the kid is going to be involved in some type of crime. Right. Because of the absence, in the absence of the father. Right. So that just speaks volumes on how much of a role we play, or how much of a role God gave us. Sure. So, Absolutely. You know, s- s- I, I want to admit to you and confess to you, uh, and I believe this. Uh, I, I, I believe there's two negative forces working against men becoming Christians or churchmen and, and taking their place. Right. One is obvious, it's the attack of the enemy. I mean, as Satan wants to emasculate men, right. he wants to tear them down. I mean, our culture is filled now, as we know, with with negatives, negative comments, negative teaching, negative narratives about masculinity. To, to hear the world talk, all masculinity is toxic. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. and, and and watch the sitcoms on television. You know, you've got smart women, but you've got bungling, idiotic husbands. Right. I yeah. mean, I could name several sitcoms that that, that picture men like that. Okay, so so this is a this is a calculated attack of the enemy against men, their place in God's uh, uh, designed order, and and masculinity itself. Then the second force that I think that has hurt men is the church has not stepped up and discipled men to be men. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned a while ago so many churches denominations for centuries have been. Feminine. I mean, they decorate in feminine ways. They 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 uh, sing and worship in feminine ways. They use feminine uh, uh, figures of speech and articulations a lot of times. Um, yeah, and you see that a lot in the uh, Catholic Church. Actually. Well, you see it in a, in a lot of churches. And while many churches are uh, have oppressed women and said only men can lead, only men can speak, only men can do these things. But then they depend on those women that they have oppressed to be the backbone of the volunteerism. Right. And, and, and man, they'll work those women. <laughs> they'll work them and work them and work them. And, 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 and it's all out of balance. It, it's all out of kelter with, with Scripture, I believe. But, but, but we've got to... Look, let me give you an example. Mother's Day. Oh my goodness, we're giving away flowers, we're giving away gifts, we're bragging on the mother. Mother, we couldn't do without you. Oh, we love our mothers. Everybody give our mothers a hand clap. Let's feed the mothers. Let's bless the mothers. Let's give the mothers gifts. Let's give yeah. them prizes. Who's had the most babies? Oh, you get a bigger bouquet. I mean, that's the way we do Mother's Day, traditionally, for right. decades. Father's Day, it's a sermon on how you need to be a better man. You need to do this. You need to do that to be the man that, you know. You know, uh-huh. and, and, and generally, who's there? Only the men that's been coming to church anyway. The men that need to hear that probably weren't there. Because right. it's Father's Day. They're barbecuing. Right. They're throwing, back, the they're, they're, ones and everything. they're throwing back cold ones, man. Go to church on Father's Day? Uh-uh. To hear how lousy I am as a dad or as a man? No. No. What I'm going to do is I'm going to the golf course today because it's my day. And, and it's it's just backwards. Right. We We want to... Encourage men, build men, tell men about their, their their capacity. Tell tell them it's okay to be a man. In fact, it's right to be a man, you know. And we need to build on their unique uh, godliness. When 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 God created Adam and then Eve, and then He gave Adam a, an assignment. He gave Adam a job before He gave him a wife. By the way. He was to guard and cultivate the garden. Mm-hmm. Then he gives him a wife and says, I want you two together to work and to have dominion, and I want you to be fruitful and multiply. 
replenish the earth. Now remember, they had not sinned at this point. Right. They're godly people. They're godlike. They're made in the image of God. So what, what man's assignment was, I want you to protect and cultivate your home. That Eden was their home. That garden was their home. He was to guard their home and he was to cultivate their home. In other words, invest into it. Do the work involved to make it flourish. Yeah. The home. So he had he had an assignment for his home, but he also had an assignment for the world. He, with the aid of his wife, were to, they were to be they were to multiply and make the earth plentiful. Of what they were godlike, they were made in the image of God. They were to fill the earth with godlikeness, right. godlikeness, and those things are still the assignment of the human male to guard his home, to invest in his home, but also to have an impact on the world and spread God-likeness, godliness all throughout the world. When men commit themselves to those roles, they'll flourish. Right. That's their purpose. Right. Purpose is such a driving force for performance. You have to have a... Per the common denominator with addicts, drug addicts, alcohol addicts, any kind of addict, the, the, the common denominator is these are people without a purpose. Right. If you don't have a purpose to live, you do things to destroy yourself. Right, that, that, that's so true. And, and so fi men finding their purpose and then being encouraged to pursue that purpose, to be the men that God created the men to be. I mean, I believe that's key. Right, oh, totally. And I'm thinking about like, you know, watching you watch TV and you watch like, mm -hmm. movies. There's a very few instances of movies that I'd say today that have like, I'm not saying that these movies are Christian, but they have a, they have a right message of what, what a man should be. You look in the 80s and 90s, you had all the action stars, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, right? Mm -hmm. Super stoic, super disciplined, will, you're going to do the right thing, they're smart, they're not dumb. And they have all the other characters, they have women on that, but they don't be, it doesn't belittle them and doesn't belittle, belittle the person today. Today, all you see in shows and movies are men are putting down under. Men are not good enough. They're weaker. They're, they're not as educated or intellectually smart. Mm -hmm. um, the one I know Pastor Newman was, he, I was with him like during the drive, it was when John Wick 4 came out. Oh. And he was like, I love that movie. I love that movie so much. I watch all of them all the time. And, he's, and he made a comment and was like, man, it's so hard to find a movie that has these type of heroes. Like a man who goes through all these situations, who goes, gets heated up, that keeps coming back up, and, you know, does what he's supposed to do. He's not weak, he's not emasculated, he's not scared, he's not timid, he doesn't, he doesn't go to his emotions and rely on them. And, and the other thing, too, that I, that I, that I especially like the Old Testament, is of the Proverbs, it talks about you need to have a sound mind. And and in the Greek, in the Stoic tradition, the Stoics believe in the anthraxia of the mind, which translates to the tranquility of the mind. And it's also the same word for, for sound mind in the New Testament. Is a mind that's disciplined and at peace, rationally thinking, and the uh, Paul, what Paul would continue, he uses the same word in, um, I think it's Ephesians, uh, that is referring to on God's calling in our life. God's purpose in my life. I am focused on what God has called me to do in purpose. I'm not going to rely on what my emotions tell me or what they tell me because the heart lies above all, all things. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to call and, do, uh, call and follow. And it's, it's sad today that, that men are just being de-emasculated. And I, and I agree, it's, it's definitely an attack from the state of said it out of most because he wants to destroy the family unit. Because he's, he's, I think in the last... Since like uh, Billy Graham was a huge, you know, evangel evangelism, people were born in church. It was everywhere. Even that movie, the Jesus movie that, that came out, um, I forgot what it was called. No, 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 it was the other one. It was more recent. But he's like, okay. The church is growing. The church is growing. The church is growing. He wants the house divided amongst itself. So he's like, okay, I can't do it at the church so far. It's not working as well. C.S. Lewis in his book called The Screw Tapes. It's an awesome book. It's letters of like a demon writing to another demon how to mess with someone, like, oh, this is what you should do, or do this, do this. In one of the letters, he says, attack the father 
so that the family divides itself and separates itself from the church. And doing that one work, it may be tedious, but if you continue doing it, you will exceed from separating them from, from our enemy and screw tape it by enemy who means Jesus, because he's a demon. So as men recently, I've seen the last one here, I've been attacked, 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 attacked from the family home. They are now separating from the church, and because of that, the church is, I want to say that it's getting weaker, because, I mean, the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but I would say that it's preventing people from continuing knowing who God is and, and, and getting salvation and living the life that God wants them to do. Because yeah. the devil's like, okay, I can't get rid of salvation, but maybe I can't deter it, but however, let me just water it down so its effects are not as great. So instead of the church being the huge light on the hill, I'm going to try to put a lamp shell over it so it's a little bit dimmer, just so I can, you know, cause more darkness in those world. And he's doing that by attacking men. And yeah. and, and you see that it, that it, how it works that way. And they are actually getting weaker, I would say that, uh, nowadays. I was talking to one of my clients, uh, she's going through some emotional work for so uh, she just had a baby, Fathers are a major yeah. voice to boys and girls, mm -hmm. sons and daughters. Even at that age. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but then, I, I think that as we as parents, we want our kids to be able to sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. But does it even if they're out of the house, I think a lot of a lot of marriages I, I can't speak on saying that I know everything about the marriage, but this is just a generalization. Is that there's some that they stick together and they're having issues, and then as soon as the kids turn 18 and move out, then they get a divorce because they don't want to be together or anything else. But if the situation could be resolved, they should continue doing it because that kid that's out of the house is going to look back at his parents exactly. and realize, wow, the last 18 years have been alive, they just did this just for that, and then they separate. I, I know I know people who are in their 50s and their, and their and, not 50, sorry, in their 40s and their parents divorce in their 60s or their parents are at, at odds with each other or the father doesn't talk to his wife anymore and they have to go, oh, this, oh, dad, or, or their, their kids are like, hey, oh, dad, are we going to go look, go see grandpa? No, we're going to go see grandma this time. Grandpa doesn't want to come. And it's already affecting that next generation. It's, 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 it's the, the sin is carrying over that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tragic, but I mean, so let's let's get into the next part because now we talked about we talked about that, and we're starting to get into what what are the truths about men. I'm going to open it up and then ask for David to go into this. So I was um, I was reading Genesis. I was reading uh, more a little bit of uh, a Proverbs because Proverbs is Solomon. Oh, the first ten chapters are King David and his wife giving wisdom to Solomon, and then Solomon does after chapter ten. It's all him. But he's speaking to his own kids about live by wisdom, son. Live by this. Avoid this. Do this. And um, in Genesis, the, the beginning thing is that we are created in the image of God. Genesis chapter one, verse uh, twenty-seven. The uh, the link between the word Adam, which is the idea of Adam. Adam means humanity, right? Is that it's to reinforce the reinforced technological link between humankind in the ground, emphasizing both the way in which man was created to cultivate the world, like what you were talking about, and how it originated from the dust of the ground, people who are seen from here. So the idea of Amidah in the Hebrew is that 
Man, Your Honor, it, it's speaking of, of humankind, but I mean, it still fits with our roles as well. Is that on earth, from the dust of the earth, we are meant to cultivate and build up. Right, so what are we called to build up? What does Paul say? We are here to build up the church. We're here to lead people to Christ. As he wrote all his letters to, to Corinthians, to Ephesians, and all that, it was that he was, what were we supposed to do? Men are supposed to be the, the leaders of the church. They're supposed to continue following through what they're supposed to be doing. And and to be a man after God's own heart, like King David. And, and Solomon in the Proverbs, he talks about live by wisdom, deter from wickedness, deter from foolishness. He, he even, he even it doesn't, he gives an example, he gives a good metaphorical claim, uh, um, not metaphorical, yeah, metaphorical, or symbolism, when he talks about avoid the temptress, avoid the woman that is elusive to you, to bring destruction, to bring calamity to you. He meant that in both ways. One is that he meant that in like an actual female who is going to tempt you. She could even tempt you, actually in Proverbs, some of the, when you read some of the Proverbs, it's a correlates to even today. It doesn't just mean sexual advances. It means that she'll break you down by your roles. She'll take away your power as a man of what you're supposed to do. What, what you're supposed to do for your family. Take you away from that. But it's 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 more of the symbol of the idea of the 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 temptation of the world and to to just falter and just, just put yourself in the square box. And just do what's pleasurable, just do what's, what's fun and exciting. But don't do anything that, you know, that is what we're supposed to do. And in life, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's nothing about life is going to be easy, right? But there's an adventure of it and continuously doing what we're supposed to do for the church. And I always hear Ben talk about being a Christian is too hard. I hear that from my friends. Oh, a Christian is, is too much of a hard life. Like, I can't do that. I say two things. It's hard, but the easiest thing to do. What I mean by that is that it's hard to fight the good fight of faith, but I'm not alone. It's so easy knowing that I have an objective truth leading me to my future. Versus, well, before I was saved, I had no objectivity, I had no wisdom, I was going by my own whim, whatever my flesh told me to do, I was carly minded. But now that I'm spiritually minded, I have a purpose. I'm not alone. No matter what circumstances I'm going through, I'm not alone. Jesus is with me all the time, and then Jesus will bring people to me, like a, 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 like a, bro, a brother, a sh- iron sharpens iron, that's going to keep building me up in the faith. And then when any circumstances comes my way, I'm not absorbed in anxiety. I'm like, you know what? I cast this care to you, Lord, and I'm going to go through it. But if I know that I wasn't saved and I was in that same situation, I'd be freaking out. Yeah, would break me. So with you, uh, David, um, what, what do you? What is an example? What is, what defines a man? What are what are some qualities of a man? Okay. By the way, the, the idea that being a Christian is hard is absolutely a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says, and the Bible is the truth. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. It might take a while for them to figure out how hard they've made it on themselves to transgress. Right. But it ends up the hardest life in the world to live is one without God and going your own way and calling your own shots and destroying yourself. That's hard. So actually, the Christian life is easier than right. the hard life. Right. Um, I I, I want to focus on one verse that's found in 1 Corinthians 16 to answer your question. Let's talk about what a God the man is. Okay. Uh, this was written to the whole church, and this is there's elements here that anybody can do, man or woman. But he brings up the, the thought of acting like men here. This is 1 Corinthians 16, 13. So Paul writes, he says, Watch ye, which means stay awake. Stand fast in the faith. Literally stand firm in the faith. Then he says, this is Old English, King James, quit you like men. It doesn't mean to be a quitter. It means literally act like a man. The, the Greek word translated men is the word androzomai. Androzomai. It's and the root word is aner, which is the Greek word for man or husband. Literally, in the Greek, it, it, it literally means act like a man, which would include manliness, bravery, things like that. Okay. So he says, stay awake, stand firm in your faith, 
act like men. One of our teachers at the conference says, number one, that means don't act like a woman. Okay, now, this is controversial maybe these days, and uh, we may hurt someone's feelings or even anger someone, but here's a fact. Men are different from women. Right. And women are different from men. And they are supposed to be different, and they're supposed to act different, and they're not supposed to be the same. They're supposed to complement one another. No, neither one of, the, of them are to oppress the other one. Right. Neither we, we are not to steal femininity from women, and women shouldn't be stealing masculinity from men. And men should not act or think feminine, and women should not act or think masculine. I know that's upsetting to some people. That's still the truth. Oh, but it's, it's, uh, you're absolutely it's right. Truth. That's okay. totally right. Uh, and you, there's even psychological evidence for all that. Oh, that well, absolutely. Yeah. What is truth? What is truth? That's our. This is, yeah. That's your. My fuck right. Your, your okay. Your whole deal here. Your right. whole vision here. Let's answer the question. What is truth? Tr only truth is truth. How you feel. People talk about my truth. Your truth. There's no such thing as my truth, your truth. There's only such thing as the truth. Right. Exactly. Jesus said he's the truth, and so Jesus defines truth. A thing is only true if Jesus says it's true. Right. Is science true? Yeah, as long as that science is accurate because Jesus created science. Right. And so there is truth to be found in science. We're not unscientific. Oh, of course not. Like, well, the, no. Like, no. Like, like, so science are still proves the truth because a lot like going back to the feelings that you were mentioning, well, I feel like a woman, and this and that. Okay, great, then you feel, you're not. If you feel like a woman, this is what you're doing. It's not your real audience. It's, it's right. not. Okay, it, you want to base yourself in science? Perfect. Go back to your chromosomes. You have based on what? Exactly. You're a man. Exactly. Right, and, and, and the crazy thing, too, is uh, that even science, so because atheists are like, oh, we're so rational. We don't need Christianity. It's so primitive, right? People are going to go by science. And then the atheists are like, they're freaking out because they're like, people are like saying science isn't true even though it's been a fact for thousands of years. Yeah, atheists are on our side on this issue. Yeah, you're seeing, you're seeing them come to, some, not all, but some of them coming together yeah. like, man, you know what? Some of the stuff that even that the Bible says is kind of coming true. And I'm, I'm looking at Revelations. It, it seems to be coming Let's true. Reconsider. Yeah. Yeah, let's reconsider. Okay, so, so he says this. He says, stay awake, stand firm. A man's supposed to be firm. Right. Act like a man. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity or, the, or love. Okay? Now, I think this is true manhood. Being awake, watching. He's supposed to be protected. He's supposed to be watching. Right. Right. Somebody's got to watch. He's going to have to stand firm. Somebody has to be the rock of Gibraltar. Someone has to be the guardian. Someone has to be on watch and standing on the uh, on the wall to protect the family, to protect the church, to protect the community, to protect the culture, right? Act like men. We have to take action. We got to be men are to be people of action, doing things, creating things, building things. A man was the first cattle rancher. A man was the first builder of cities. Right. A man was the first fabricator uh, uh, of of uh, iron. A man was the first inventor of a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, okay. True. Okay. All right. And then he says, let all your things, he says, be strong. Men are to be strong. The world is trying to make men weak. The, 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 the world and Satan, who's the God of this world, is filling our television screens and our social media with feminine acting men. <clears throat> distract he comes against the veracity of the scripture he comes against the truth of the church <clears throat> Satan comes against uh, scientific truth and, the, and, and distracts us from all these things and then shows us a picture of a man that's not being a man anymore and get, making that the example and that's what we must tolerate that's what we must celebrate that's what that's we what must, we must consume that's what we must become so we won't be toxic anymore so we won't be mean anymore so we won't oppress women anymore 
we can lift women without lowering masculinity. Right. They're unique and they stand on their own foundation. One, it does not exclude the other. We should elevate and, 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 and celebrate femininity in women. And we should celebrate masculinity in men. And then he says, so be strong and let everything be done with love. I believe true manhood is strength and love. A strength to do what's necessary, a love to do for who is important in your life. If you want to see what a man is, look at Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The perfect mixture of strength. Man, he never let anybody get anything over on him. Right. But love, compassion, healing, lifting, forgiving, yeah. giving second chances, feeding the hungry, uh, delivering the oppressed. You know, that's, that's, if you want, what's manhood? Look at Jesus. Jesus was the perfect man. And in our ministry here at our church, where I'm serving, that's our that's really our vision. Uh, our, our well, our vision is teaching people how to live the abundant life that Jesus came right, to give right, them, right. right? But the men's ministry mission is to help men become the men that God created them to be. Right. Jesus says, "Follow me, and I'll make you. I'll make you into what I've really called you to be." And that's that's what yeah, our mission. Like, how can you live the abundant life if you're not going to go and grab it? You have to, you have to be strong. Like I, I did a message on Joshua one, and the Hebrew word for be strong and courageous, right, is hazak. Uh, hazak in the Hebrew is a strength that is binding by God by action and purified in the word by constant engagement. There you go. It's, it's constant engagement. That's staying awake and staying strong. <laughs> Old and firm. Right. Yeah. yeah, like I said, constant. And um, I love, including myself, this quote from Al Solid. And the question about consistency is uh, you are what you do to you. Therefore, excellence should not be a act. It should be a habit. Yeah. Right. And by excellence is bringing the best of yourself, bringing the best of us as a man to God, to your family, to your blood. Yeah, and, and to build off of that, Aristotle, um, um, the Nicomachean ethics is great. A lot of the words and verbiage is used in the Bible. So um, I'm, I'm actually doing a work on how classic philosophers, all their dialogue was the words that they used was taken straight into scripture and how Christianity saved the Greek world and its, and its writing. Um, but anyway, I built on that. Aristotle was talking about, okay, what is a courageous man? He, he gives three examples. There's the coward, the man of courage, and then the fool. The coward is the one who's just he's timid. He doesn't do anything. He lets it bag on, and he's a pacifist, meaning that he he excuses himself. Oh, if I don't participate and do anything about it, I'm fine. I'm virtuous. I'm still good. Aristotle no calls him a coward because you have the ability to take action and you do nothing. The fool is the opposite, but what he does is that he takes every action, every engagement, but he lets everything bother him. So he's not emotionally scout minded. Someone pushes him like this, he goes in a fit rage and starts throwing stuff, flipping tables over, he has no control over himself. He, he, he's not wise, he's not, he, he retaliates with anger, not with love. But the courageous man, the brave man, there are some said he compared him to a general, he, he's Spartan. So he says that a Spartan who makes the battle, he knows when to take lead, when to t advance, when to, to not advance. He is sharp and he's keen on what he should do. He's willing to make peace so that no, uh, uh, he's will, he's, he's capable of harm, but he, he puts you up front of peace, right? Exactly. And, and Aristotle talks about that, and I love what Jesus says in the, um, what's it called, the Beatitudes. He says, the meek shall inherit the earth. For, for years, it was a mistranslation from Greek to Latin, uh, and Latin, meek had the idea of like timidity, soft, kind, a form of humbleness, but it was more to Greek. But in the Greek, the Greeks would have looked at them and laughed at them. Like, That's not what meekness means. Uh, Socrates, who in the Greek times considered the most meek person amongst the Greeks, because he wasn't afraid to talk about what he believed was true, and he ended up getting martyred because of that. And he actually was the first of the Greek philosophers who believed in one God. They killed him because of it. Uh, 
the idea of meat and the way it's defined in the uh, uh, when meat shot inherent earth is the word trial. It's a Greek word that is, means control power, wise and focused on when to act, and at the right time with the most effective strength. It even continues to mean the warrior of a meat embodies both the fierce aspect of a real warrior, the ability to make war, and the gentle aspect to make peace. And it, it is so true when, when it's precious in the meek shall inherit the earth. Those are men who are controlled, men who are who have the ability. It's like it, uh, the literal translation is like a sword that's sheep. He has the ability to do harm, but he, he has achieved so he can do peace, right? And he and he has that controlled power. He has a discipline. You know, I'm, this situation came up. I'm not going to retaliate in anger. I'm going to retaliate with wisdom and do what's right. I'm going to retaliate with love. That could even be mercy to his enemies. I think a really strong, strong thing about men, and men define this as a strength, but it's true, is being able to forgive someone. Mm, yeah. If, if you have to be able to forgive someone, that's a real semblance of strength. Is that someone does you wrong, but even then you forgive them. That shows a testament to how your mind and your heart are like, I know this person trying to get trap trying to get against me, but I am going to forgive them. Not for their benefit, for the benefit of my own self, because unforgiveness makes the heart sick, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a that's a quality of the strong man. It's, it's weakness. That's I, um, a lot of the medieval thinkers uh, and some contemporaries are are talking about meekness. I mean, you look at it when you look at YouTube videos. Meekness. Jordan Peterson's whole thing about meekness. He said that no, you should be a monster. You should be a god. You should be this, but you should learn how to control it. What he means by that is that you shouldn't be timid. You have to be strong. Mm -hmm. And what are we strong into? In our own strength? No. In the word of God. Jesus made his promise to uh, the, the word meekness, one of the characteristics of meekness is correct, correctable, to be correctable. And so that goes along with what you're saying. Uh, a correctable man is someone who will consider, who will be adjusted. Who will, who will who will change, who will who will listen to logic, listen to another idea, get a new idea, think it through, look at the context of the problem or the issue or the challenge, and and make the he's self controlled enough to where he doesn't just go off emotionally, but but he's willing to do what it takes to get the job done. So that that's a part of meekness as well. Right. Uh, the last thing we're going to say in Aristotle and Lebanon's actually the fool. He says the fool is uncorrectable. Yeah. The courageous man is correctable right. in action. Yeah. So, like, in the moment, he's really correctable. Yeah. He's not correctable weeks later. He's in the moment and he's correctable. Meekness is absolutely necessary for a military force to win a battle. You know, oh, they always totally. saying that, that uh, they have a battle plan, but once the battle starts, anything yeah, can be changed. It goes out the window, right? It goes out the window. And they've got to be able to think on the ground. They've got to be able to adjust to do what they've got to do to win. Meekness is the ability to do what it takes to win. Uh, I'm going to name some virtues and then you know, get asked the next couple of questions to you. Yeah. It's going to be three questions. But uh, just some quick tips if you guys want to write you know, something. Um, if you are writing notes. So I think virtues of a godly man is that he's sober-minded. Meaning that he's aware, like he's awake. Mm -hmm. He knows what he's doing. So it's a biological thing too. Men throughout generations have always been awake, protecting their families when they're asleep. The godly man is humble, is that he's not living in pride. Because if he lives in pride, he's not thinking of his family, he's thinking of himself. Mm -hmm. A godly man is responsible, so he's willing to take action when he when he messes up. Or if someone messes up, he's willing to take responsibilities to serve in that area. Um, a godly man is honest. Uh, that's a major thing today. Truth, like yeah. my thing is, oh, what is truth? Honesty is a huge thing, and I'm trying to live my life being more honest. Because uh, it's very easy to to, to lie uh, when you're afraid or scared, but truth is the thing that you know, sets you free. Dignified means that he carries himself. He he lives a Christian life. He doesn't just preach it and he lives a hypocrite. I mean, we're all hypocrites. We all make mistakes. But the the important thing is that you're making a habit of being dignified. You're not. Good Christian man on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, you're you're someone else. You're terrible. Yeah. 
And that's uh, in the main touch, and then we'll wait. That's okay. This one, my girlfriend and I were talking about it yesterday. Uh, because she does make She's freaking amazing at it. And she was telling me that she has a friend, not a friend, she knows a person that used to be a bully in high school or in high school. And she would talk to them bad to people, to them bad, uh, a lot of people with their ex and stuff like that. She will do things to other people, and she's in make of the next people, the artists, the actors, and the actresses. And she's like, yeah, how does she do this? I mean, the moment it's just about it. I do that. We tend to see only the good. A lot of people like to show that because of the way we want to see the patients. And um, so they have to tell you that we actually talk about. Uh, there's a guy that we we'll talk to a lot. His name is Cindy Jones. Uh, I love the story. And he has this book, and this book that he has is Envy Block. It's like you have to have some block. What I mean by that is that. You just a good Christian, you have to be a good father, you have to just be a good father, you have to be a good friend, just be a good friend, be a good man. Why? Be great, you'll be successful in your business. Don't get excited when you want to get your family. What is good then? What is good about him being a colleague and loving wife? It has to be your mother said on marriage for her, so you can be. It's true. If, if every every hour of your life, we have we have to be dignified, for and continuously, you know, be in that process of being aware of ourselves. Um, last point is of knowing that showing integrity. That's, that's a big big thing. A sound speech, and then the last one said the, the fundamental. I think it's the funda the most fundamental that all of the corresponding things is just being me, getting that on um, a stable head is being me. So now we're going to ask you that person. Yeah, and the next deal that we have is um, do men have a valid purpose? And then that's the other two. Oh, the other two. Okay. Do men have a valid uh, purpose? Uh, they will let them respect in the family homes for men. And uh, how can they have the ability and duty to take charge against evil with problems come as important? How can you explain that? And then go ahead and uh, read to me. Uh, Timothy uh, 6, verse 12, 12, but read, Let us read, O oh man of God, between these things, consideration, as godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take a hold of eternal life to which you were called, and about which you were made the godless confession. You got the good confession. In the presence of many witnesses. Their first question is Do men have a godly purpose? I'm going to go back to Genesis again. To the, let's obey the law of first mention. Anytime the Bible first mentions something, that's a, that's, that's a, a trait or a, a truth that's going to carry all through Scripture. When God created Adam, He said, uh, He gave him purpose. Okay, came from God, so it's godly purpose. He says, I want you to guard and keep or cultivate the garden. Okay, to guard was to protect it, and then to cultivate was to make it fruitful. So a man's godly purpose is to be protective and productive. Just think of it like that. Protective, to protect the gospel, to protect your home, your family, your friends, your relatives, to be to be a defender, to be a protector of anything that's anything and anyone that's precious. Huh? That's that's precious to you. To be a protector. To be productive. We're here to produce. I I, I mentioned the first man was the first, a man was the first cattle rancher, first artificer, the first musician, all these things. Okay. He's to be productive, to produce. We're not here to just bide our time and live and die and pay a few taxes on the way. Okay, right. no, no, no. We're here to <laughs> produce something. To produce. 
men produce children with the help of women. We're to be productive. Women, men are to grow crops. That's being productive. Men build companies. Men uh, build their families. Men are builders. They're producers. And, and we're here to make a difference. Think of the parable of the talents. God gives one man five wages of gold or another one two and another one one according to their ability. What did he want? He wanted them to produce with that investment. To produce. The first one hit it. The second one hit it, but the guy was given five wedges of gold. He actually invested it and made it grow. Well, God ended up taking away the other guy's wedges of gold and giving it to the guy that was pretty. God blesses productivity. Right. So our, our godly purpose, I believe, can be boiled down to two simple words. Protective, to be productive, and to be productive. Uh, we're not here to be a slug. Just, just you know... Uh, just Hang exist. Out. We're not here to just watch football and drink beer. No, right. no we're not here to, to, to heap upon ourselves whatever whatever millions we make or whatever ego we develop or whatever uh, hobby I want to do and everybody just leave me alone, let me do my deal. We're not here to, to, to be vacant, to be, to be AWOL. No, we're here to serve, to serve. And in our serving, we're protective and productive. Right. I totally yeah. agree. Now, I lost touch with your other question. But uh, so the other one would be, uh, uh, the, do, they, do men have the ability and duty to take charge? Uh, yes, but not in the sense of being King Kong. Okay. Okay. How about in the sense of being King Jesus? Uh, right. Let's be like Jesus. We're not dictators. Right. We're not to be... Uh, uh, oppressive. Our job is not to to be the boss of women. Our job is to be the example and the leaders for our women and for our children. Right. And so I, I think there's been a lot of wrong impressions left by some ministers when they talk about men being men and that 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 men are the, are are the leaders. No, 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 no. Men, men are not the leaders. Men are to be leaders, but to say they are the leaders would, would be to exclude any leadership role for a woman, and that can't be true. That's not true. Women, a single mom has to lead. Right. Yeah. A mother leads. Many, many men today respond much more positively to feminine voices of leadership than male voices of leadership simply because they were raised by a mom and a grandma. I, I, I'm a defender of women and femininity just like I am a, a defender of men and masculinity. Women can and do lead. Now, women are indispensable, but so are men. We need both men and women in their roles. Yes, men are the leaders of their wives and the leaders of their families, but they're not the only ones that can lead a country or a company or a movement. I just want to clarify that. Women can also do that. So yes, men are to lead. But, uh, but not in a sense that they're the only ones that can lead. Women just always have to follow the men in every avenue of life. I don't think that that's true. Okay. Right. And, uh, that's, that's 100% true. Because, yeah. Uh, something that I like to think about is having, I'm not married yet, because my plan with um, my girlfriend, uh, something that I always tell her that I believe that it's going to help us to be complete and like nothing is... Something that Chris told us a long time ago that the word and the voice of the woman to the man can build them or break them. Oh, yeah. And that's super important. And something you brought up is that uh, in the Bible it says, no. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll correct you yeah. if I have to. <laughs> uh, when the man speaks, the woman has to be quiet. But what it means in that is that the woman should. Man, because those words break and Right, because I'm going to give some context of what that what it was talking about. So, especially today, you have women that will nag, 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 nag their husband, beat them down, beat them down, beat them down, beat them down, beat them down. By silent is like silent to the nagging. It's it's building and helping them in confidence in the situation. A good example would be like 
um, let's say I was I, I was married, whatever, and I have my wife, and I mess up with this one thing, we won't get a financial crash. I'm getting hit by work, and then I come home, and she's hitting me. You're not good enough. You're just like what they say you are. You're just doing that. Don't even say if you're gonna if you have something to say, don't even say anything at all. Instead, she'd be like, you know what, honey, we're going through this, but we're gonna get through it this way. We're gonna we're gonna keep moving forward. That's like the the, uh-huh. the benefiting of the woman's role, like. Like they have an idea, like I like, especially like men who have a really wrong idea, or like the the very prideful man, very machismo man is like, oh, my wife must submit to me, and I can. Okay, here's the thing: before the idea even first sent to me, I'm gonna be the man that she, I'm going to be the golly man that's worth submitting to, so that when she comes with me, that she knows I have my trust and confidence in him. He he is he is not an abuser. He's not gonna he's not gonna lead me astray. I'm going to help them in the situation. And as we become two, become one, we unify and we build each other up. The two become one, you know, the idea of two becomes one flesh. And we, we both have different roles, but we, we co-host if we, you know, we fit together in the mold. Whatever I'm lacking in, she, she could help me in. And whatever she's lacking in, I'm helping her in that situation. And, uh, the, 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 the wrong idea of men is that, Oh, she should never talk out of turn. She should never do this. She's, 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 it's my way or the highway. That's not a godly marriage. That, that's, that's your, you're married to yourself in that, in that engagement. You're not married to the person that you're with. It's, it's a building up of together. I mean, even in Proverbs, when it says, when it speaks about wisdom and she cries out in the street, right? It's given in a feminine, feminine term. Like the idea that a lot of men, like the idea of women, Speaking about the word of God, oh, they can't have wisdom. But it's only a man's thing to have like wisdom. No, the, Solomon was directly quoting the, in in feminine terms that wisdom cries out into the streets. Who could hear? It's a fe, it's a feminine term. Your wife could bring wisdom into your life if you listen to her and do what you're supposed to do. And vice versa with the husband is that a man who's who's fortified and I'm going to just say stoic in the sense of like. He's controlling himself. Not that he's hiding away from his demands, but he's, he's controlling himself. Mm-hmm. It's something that the wife can help with him in that situation. It's very important for both the man and the woman to step into their roles. Let, let me explain something about women. First of all, men, Adam and Eve, but were given dominion by God right. before the fall. Both of them. They were to go out and take dominion. If you read it closely in Genesis, all right, then, uh, uh, and, and I'll say this, if a man does not take a dominion, women are built for dominion. They'll rise up and take dominion. It's in them because that was the original creation of, of God that both of them will be people of dominion, people that can exercise authority. Right. They can take charge. Okay? Now, when the tempter came, when the devil came and tempted Eve, okay, uh, then she turns and, and, and gives the fruit, the forbidden fruit. She tasted it, then gave to her husband who was with her. Her husband wasn't stepping up. See, he wasn't, he wasn't being protective. He, he wasn't, he wasn't exercising dominion over that serpent. He, he, he stayed quiet. He didn't answer correctly to his wife. He didn't answer correctly to the serpent. The Bible says that the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. The woman was, <laughs> you know, she was fooled by the, by the serpent. But Adam, he willfully sinned with full revelation of what he was doing wrong. And he simply did not step up and resist the devil and fight the devil off. What he what he was tempted to do was listen to the confusion of his wife and then act on that rather than doing what he knew to be right, which was to stand up, be, be awake, right? right? Be firm in the faith mm-hmm. and to and to come into conflict and, and into opposition to the devil who became their enemy. The reason we're all in all this mess in a fallen world is because is because Adam, the man, did not step up. All right, 
And when he didn't step up, the wife was left to offer him the... He, he never said a word while the, yeah, while, the de while the devil was talking to his wife back and forth. He stayed silent. And there's a lesson there. Men, if you don't talk to your wives, uh, the, de the devil will send a snake to talk to her. Yeah. Right, yeah, and they—that's wow. that's so true. Because I mean, think about that in terms of cheating, right? Yeah, like it's like okay, I'm 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 having issues with my wife. I'm sick of seeing from her. I'm gonna stop talking to her, right? Then the snake is clever too. He's he's gonna make it all innocent. Um, did he truly say? Make it look good, right? It's like your friends are like, girl, this this is what happened to you. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that, right? Even your friends could be. Doing something they can mean well, but it's bringing you apart. Another person comes in, uh, who who here's another thing too that I think it's important to touch on, because the man is lacking in the protection, uh, uh, protection and awakeness, right? The other person, the other guy who's listening to her, he's fulfilling those roles that she wants. Correct. He's protecting by listening to what she has. He's awake and he knows the situation that she's going through, and he even provides like some type of like help or like. Oh, oh, I can help you this. Oh, you shouldn't do that, right? She's getting all. She's getting all that, but from not from where she's supposed mm -hmm. to be getting it from. Right. And it's it's a design of the devil for this guy to step in and to offer what she's not getting. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, to take him out, and I, I, that that it's it's true. I I didn't, actually I didn't even, I didn't even know about the the idea of him being silent during all that. I always imagined it like Adam and Eve were walking. Adam's you know naming, naming oh, I'm gonna name this a gorilla. <laughs> a bear, so like, what's a cool name? <laughs> like, you know, I think he needs to do something like something, some guy stuff, you know, just being dumb. And then, <laughs> and then she's off looking at the tree, and then the snake. Appears. I didn't, I didn't think of it of them walking together. Right. The snake comes, and then Adam's just like, just there. He's being a slug. He's just, being He's a just slug. there doing yeah. nothing, man. Just doing nothing. That's that's crazy to think about it that way. And yeah, I mean. It's it, in a in a, in a correspond correspond to everything because I mean even after they sin it says that there'll be strife between you, um, the husband and wife there'll be strife and bickering right, and a lot of I'm going to say this last part and then we'll continue to that conclusion uh, paragraph uh, segment sorry, is that churches will say oh the reason why that 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 women should be beneath us is because it's a sin and they're living in sin and there's strife between us. And that's why we as men have to be like, no, it's shared strife. Second of all, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, meaning that we have authority over that sin, but we shouldn't let that sin rule over us. It's not, it's not a thing that's like, oh, well, I'm born again. The Bible says that this is going to happen to us, so I guess for all of my life, and so I go to heaven, I'm going to be always striking my husband I have, or my wife. I have no control over it. No, it's, it's, it, if you know it, you're aware of it, and you're going to, you know what, we're, we're going to be with your husband, right? Um, you know what? We're going to go on this together. We're not going to let the devil rule over us. We're not going to let the serpent tear us apart. We're going to come together and we're going to take care of the situation. Right. And yeah, I, a lot of people need to hear that, especially because, I mean, the divorce rate is so high. That's like one of the huge reasons. Like, it used to be 50%. Now it's at 60%. That's, wow. that's crazy. It's reaching the 60% now. Then that's one. Uh, so 60%, so you're looking at 60% across the nation, right? So you're looking at that in churches as well, in schools, in families, in work, in placement, and it's all from these distractions, lies, and temptations, trying to rob and separate the family. Let, let me give you a little good, just a little touch of good news on that front, okay? Okay, they say that the, the, the rate of divorce is 50, 60% of everybody. It's also true of Christians. Okay, that may be true. However, it is not true of church-going Christians. Right. It's mu the divorce rate is much oh, lower yeah. for for couples that actually mm -hmm. worship in the house of God and go and in, are instructed and are are being decided. Right. And another thing, another clear thing too. Congrats. And if we look at statistics, you have to read when it says "I identify as a Christian." Right. When someone says they identify as a Christian, you are taken on by their word, but you don't really know they're a Christian. Right. right. So you you got to take them by the word. So, okay, we're going to come up to our concluding segment. So, it's going to be an open discussion question. So, anyone can answer it first. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to give this, this, I love this quote. I read this in the meditations. I have the book over here uh, by Marcus Aurelius. He says, waste no time arguing about what a good man should be. 
take action, and be one. Love that. Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome. And even at, think about it, so at his time period, right? He's after Paul. The Roman Empire is coming to the moment of its period where it's starting to collapse on itself too. And one of the first things that they noticed with the collapse of the Roman Empire was the destroying of the units of men. Men were becoming feminine even back then. They were they were not being with their wives. They were uh, in constant affairs. There was discourse. They were pull in you know like Sodom and Gomorrah actions. And just as it happened then, it, it's happening now. So he was even living through the moment. He, he even saw it with his own kids. He had seven seven boys. He had, unfortunately, all seven died except for the one is the one that you see in the movie, uh, Gladiator, the one that played by Walking Phoenix. Oh. He was the, the worst one. Yeah. His other seven boys, he raised up to be men, but tragically, they all died from like cuts, sickness, and all that. But see how important, that's a good example too, Walking Phoenix, his character is like not a man whatsoever. Uh, so that's so that's what that's the quote is. So then each of us will uh, Romans fourteen Paul says. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So this is the next question, and this is an open dialogue. What consequence do you think will occur if we do not take a call? If men do not take a call, based off uh, you know we give an account ourselves an account to God. If if men don't take up the roles, what do you think are going to be the consequences in the world? Well, for me, the main thing is going to be the crumble of the family. We see it in uh, the divorce rates. We see how the, that truly affects the kids and how that leads an example. And, um, but something I truly believe is that quitting becomes a habit. And that's something you teach to your kids as well. You quit on the hard times, especially with the loved one, the one that you see in the world for the rest of your life. Can be just because life happened, um, it was situation, temptation. What's the example you give to the kids? And it goes back to what you said, you need to live all the time. And with family, it's a The Bible teaches that God is a father. And uh, most of the time when you hear the word, patriarchy today in the news, it's in, used in a negative sense, that they're right. coming against the patriarch. In other words, coming against men running everything. Well, let me, let, let me remind us, God himself is, a, is the ultimate patriarch. And he created, in the beginning, God, who is a father, created all things. God is a God of order. If men do not step up into the role God has given them, then it brings disorder. There is no order. Uh, we can see that playing out in our culture right now. Right. It, everything falls into disorder. Does it destroy the family? Yes. Beyond that, it destroys a culture. It'll destroy a nation. It destroys the world. It is part of Satan's master plan to bring to, to deface humanity to uh, completely obliterate the image of God from the human family which is going to bring about ultimately the second coming of Jesus to set everything back in order you know right. and so everything will be sub under his rule be submitted back to the fatherhood of God the Bible teaches in Ephesians that all fatherhood derives its name from God the Father right uh, so Patriarchy and fatherhood, our creator, and and order, all of that fits together. We, we, we'll never be made whole without God becoming our father and being our father and fathering us. So likewise, anytime that fatherhood is not passed down to the human family and practiced and, and saturating us, then everything begins to fall into disorder. It's the destruction of everything. Right. I, I, think, of, I think of the story of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. What was the thing that uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh was afraid of? The Egyptians are growing. I mean, they, sorry, the Jews are growing, and they're having, there's a lot of men. So what does he do? 
slaughter all the boys, mm -hmm. right? Right. Get, get rid of that generation so they're not strong enough right. to retaliate against them. There's constant of examples, even in a modern day period. Zhao, who killed like, uh, Mui Zhao killed like 65 million people. Out of that 65 million killed, the first people we killed were male boys, mm -hmm. young kids, so that they could retaliate against them. Uh, it's the idea of destroying that, the one thing that could bring order or that could bring a call of justice in, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, in a godly way. Uh, I'm not speaking of uh, all men act that way. Uh, and the culture, I mean, the culture desperately needs so the Pharaoh, he's been destroying the, trying to get rid of that generation of men because he was afraid of them taking over. And because the, the Hebrew people were growing as a nation since Joseph, they were strong. Actually, at the time of Joseph, they were, they were actually royalty too. They had, they had wealth, they had money, they were doing well. And then he had to belittle them, so he took away their riches. And to make sure that they wouldn't retaliate against that, he killed the, the males. See that today with contemporary uh, examples are, are uh, in the 19th century. A mouth killing 65 million, the majority of them were young boys, so that they wouldn't retaliate against him. And the idea is that if you take away what, what, what holds society together or what is able to bring change and who are best fit to bring change, you're able to control that society. Today, in the culture, it's, it's exactly that. It's going against men and it's going against them hard and it's moving and it's changing the, it's trying to change this generation. It only takes one generation to destroy centuries of history, right? So it's what it's trying to do, and it's the devil in the world is that it's working in this generation trying to take away from that. And I'm young, and uh, I'm not 30 or 40. I'm not. I'm still growing and learning and doing stuff like this. But I've had a sense of. I guess more maturity than most men do because I was raised by my mom, who was a, she was a single parent, and my mom had people that she was with that were not good examples of doubting men, and I've learned to deter from them and not be who they are, but I've had to teach myself and learn a lot of things on my own that I would wish that I had a father to teach me, and uh but I, thank God that I was, my mom raised me into the faith and my God, my spiritual father, he's been through there and all this situation. And he's brought up people in my life who've helped fill in those, those roles in for right. me. Um, especially like you, Pastor. You, you've helped me a lot of times, especially with, like with the Bible studies and doing that. I, I believe that's God just put you in my life because of that. And getting into the word and holding that together for myself has really elevated me. But me as my generation, seeing how desperately we need more young men to come together. I feel like if our generation isn't golly, isn't meek, and isn't continuing forward, it's going to continue to degenerate and more sure. pain, more suffering, more evils will come about. Um, C.S. Lewis even said, like, he said that demons often learn from us evil because of when we're not saved. He says that we cause so much suffering in this world because we're living by our flesh and our own desires of the rob of sin and demons just watch us do it and they just keep adding fire to it so that we continue going through that downward process when we need christ where people men of god raising up generation that's going to be following the word of god being me being knowledgeable being awake being sober-minded being protective so that the, the the attacks of the enemy have no effect and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna ask this this question what what is the benefit of truth for men? Why, why is truth important for men? Well, because of the great, of the great prevalence of untruth in the world. Okay, truth. Jesus said, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free." Well, only if you apply the truth. Right. Now, obviously, just knowing the truth won't make you free. But when you do the truth, live the truth. Act, act, be men of action and act upon the truth, right? Lies destroy. Tradition, man's false traditions that we are, a lot of religion is filled with will only leave us bound. Only truth can make us free. And freedom 
is absolutely essential to becoming who God created us to be. We have to be free to do that. God is not a slave driver and He doesn't make slaves out of His people. He makes sons and daughters of God out of His people. And that, that's a freedom. We have free will, the uh, God-given gift. We're free to choose life or death, blessing or cursing. And that's truth. Truth is God. God is truth. The Bible says every man is a liar. <laughs> every one of us have lied. God has never lied. Truth is part of the character of God, and it's going to take the character of God uh, to, to get us where we need to go, to become the man God has created us to be. Amen. And uh, the, I love this line. Uh, 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 St. Augustine, actos humanos, the human will to act. And he's referring to the human will to act for God. The will to act for the world is lies, deceptive, this deception. But truth, logos, God, is the way of life. Do you have anything to add on that? Well, like I said, the truth is going to be something you're free and obviously the only way we are going to be able to do that is starting small. Just like you have mentioned uh, previously, the focus of this body. Jesus was dead for this world. Because he knows what he's capable of, but he will take him down the road if that's what he wants to do. And because he knows what he wants. Right, being faithful for little or make you faithful for much. Exactly. Right. He actually doesn't send, he, that, that's absolutely true. He doesn't send us out and say, hey, hey, here, here's what you need to accomplish. You need to hit this level right. That's not what he does. That, that, that's. Recipe for disaster. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What he does is he says, "Hey, come and walk with me. I'll take you there." Exactly. The word "follow me" means to the twelve. Come and follow me. It literally means to walk down the same road with. He wasn't saying follow me in a single line like at the water fountain in junior high. Mm -hmm. He was saying, "No, come on, walk with me. Oh, I'm going to walk with you. Mm -hmm. Together, we're going to get you there." Yeah. 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 A boss sends you. A leader takes you. Exactly. Right. Awesome. All right. I'm going to finish with this last quote. And then we're going to go into a prayer of Pastor David. And this has to do with, okay, being a man. Okay. I'm going to follow these things. We talked about what a man is. Right. The first thing is you have to take heart. You have to take courage. Nelson Mandela said he learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Yes. And I think that's super powerful. As a man, we are, we have victory over fear. Mm -hmm. Secular world, you have the idea of conquering fear. Yeah, great. But in reality, fear still rules over you. But being born again of God, the new creation, we have authority over fear. And as we conquer fear and overcome it, and everyone else sees us, They'll see, wow, I want what he has. I want to be that man. I want to, I want to be with that. Those, the kids, I want to be like my dad. Your friends, I need to be a better father. I see what I'm supposed to be. And then you continue to with that. So, if you could, uh, consider for us for prayer. Sure. Here. Sure. Father in heaven, we approach you. We come to your throne room. You are our father. You are the creator of all things. You are the God of order. And you set everything in order in Genesis. And then it fell into this order But when mankind began to follow your enemy. We're praying, Lord God, that you'll help us to reverse the curse, to turn everything around. Lord, that men would be the men that you created us to be. Protectors, producers, following the example of Jesus himself, the God-man, or the godly man that you gave us for an example. We seek to walk with Jesus, to be like Jesus, to produce what Jesus wants to produce through us. So we ask for that, Lord. We ask that you would bless every man listening to this podcast, every man listening to these words. Help us, Lord God, to become the men that you've called us to be, created us to be, the men that you can cause us to be. We believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome.
All right. Thank you guys for watching this podcast. I want to thank Pastor David for coming apart, for doing this with me, and Neil for helping me out with cameras and lighting and everything else and his uh, feedback on this as well. Uh, we're gonna cont- I'm going to have another podcast later this week. We're going to have two. I'm going to have one with my uh, cousin of mine. We're going to go into the phil- uh, philosophical framework of Christianity and how it correlates to today's world. And then we have a podcast on me and Neil. We have a podcast this Sunday coming about what is godly relationships. So I want to thank you guys for coming in. And remember to always ask this question. Not ask this question. Remember what is truth and the truth will set you free.